When St. John Paul II was declared a saint April 27, 2014 the date was meaningful for several reasons. First of all, it is the second Sunday of Easter, that has been recognized as Divine Mercy Sunday since the Jubilee year 2000. In his homily for the Mass for the canonization of St. Faustina Kowalska, Apostle of the Message of Divine Mercy and the first saint of the new millennium, Pope John Paul II encouraged his listeners to make St. Faustina's prayer their own, Jesu Ufam Tobia. Jesus, I trust in you. When, after a long period of suffering, the Holy Father finally entrusted his soul to the Lord in 2005, it was the eve of Divine Mercy Sunday. The significance of this feast for John Paul II is no doubt part of the reason why Pope Benedict XVI celebrated his beatification on Divine Mercy Sunday in 2011. In 1982, on the first anniversary of the assassination attempt against him, John Paul II famously said, in the designs of Providence there are no mere coincidences. The same could easily be said about the date of his canonization, for April 27 was also a date of great importance for Pope John Paul II and the Church in Poland. On this date in 1960, a pivotal incident took place in the city of Nova Huta as Karol Wojtyla, then a young auxiliary bishop, served in nearby Krakow. For the future Pope, the events of this day and those that followed would come to symbolize the beginning of the new evangelization. Nova Huta, literally, the new steel mill, the easternmost district of Krakow, was originally constructed as a new city following World War II. At the heart of the rapidly developing city stood the Lenin steelworks, a grim maze of metal catwalks, brick towers and massive blast furnaces, a symbol of the industrial might of the Soviet Union. The decision to construct an Huta adjacent to the ancient city of Krakow was a deliberate strategy on the part of the communist authorities. For centuries, Krakow had been the intellectual and cultural center of Poland, due largely to the presence of the 600-year-old Jagiellonian University. The huge steel mill was intended to transform this academic city into a prototypical city of workers, an embodiment of communist ideology. According to communist propaganda, the residents of Nova Huta were expected to give up the old Catholic worldview, one post-war newspaper stated that citizens should be snatched from the clutches of the clergy and taught how to love communism. Thus would the new man be forged. Certainly, Nova Huta was a very comfortable place to live in those times. There was a cinema and theater, as well as sports clubs, libraries and schools. However, one structure was conspicuously absent from the urban plan, a church. Despite the fact that the majority of the population consisted of Catholic peasants from the surrounding villages, it was designed to be the first communist city without God. For many years, residents of Nova Huta tried to get permission to build the church for which they longed. Following what came to be called the political thaw October 1956 the communist authorities finally gave permission to build a place of worship in the city square. Citizens immediately placed a large wooden cross there, and the square became the center of the city's religious life. Regular prayers, as well as occasional masses, were organized near the cross. A church, however, was not built. The citizens struggled for years to obtain construction permits, until the authorities finally decided that a school would be built in the city square instead. And it was ordered that the cross be removed. On the morning of April 27, 1960, a corps of workers guarded by armed officers arrived early in the morning to tear down the Nova Huta cross. A group of women saw what was happening and equipped themselves with shopping carts, brooms, bricks and bottles. A short time later, when a shift at the steel mill was let out, more than a thousand men started making their way toward the cross-carrying shovels, pickaxes and other tools. In a spontaneous act of civil disobedience, 5,000 workers and citizens suddenly gathered in the square. After several hours, what began as a non-violent protest devolved into street fight against the militia, and the police special forces. Lasting for days, 
The defense of the cross led to bloody repression, a dozen people were killed and hundreds were injured, more than 500 demonstrators were arrested, 87 received prison sentences and many more lost their jobs. The witness of the protest, though, was not in vain, for the cross remained standing over the city without God. In the defense of the cross in Nova Huta, a young bishop named Karol Vytila played an important role. Just two years earlier, Archbishop Evgeniusz Buziak of Krakow had come under fire for recommending Vytila as an auxiliary bishop of the Archdiocese. The majority of Krakow priests were critical of the decision because young father Vytila was inexperienced and had no family connections among the elite of Krakow. Archbishop Buziak defended the appointment, arguing that he wanted a bishop to grind, not for decoration. Also, Father Vytila had been trained as a worker, and understood the theoretical foundations of communism. Such a man, the Archbishop concluded, would be particularly valuable to the Church in Krakow. Ordained September 28, 1958, Bishop Vytila worked in this difficult ministry with great sacrifice. From the beginning, he strongly supported efforts to build a church in Nova Huta. After the protests in the city square, he protected victims of communist repression and organized open-air midnight masses under the cross on Christmas Eve despite the severe Polish winter. Pope Paul VI was elected in June 1963 and appointed Wojtyla as the new Archbishop of Krakow, several weeks after Christmas. Later, just three days following the closing of the Second Vatican Council in December 1965, the Pope presented Archbishop Vytila with a stone from the tomb of St. Peter. Take this stone back to Poland, he said. May the Church of Nova Huta be built on it. Thanks to the undying perseverance of the city's Catholics, the first church in Nova Huta was finally built in 1977. When Cardinal Vytila traveled to Rome for the conclave and was elected Pope in October 1978, he took with him a piece of the wooden cross of Nova Huta. During his first apostolic journey to his homeland in June of the following year, the communist authorities did not permit John Paul II to visit the church in Nova Huta. Instead, he celebrated Mass at the shrine and medieval Cistercian monastery in Megilla, a nearby village. Founded in the 13th century, the monastery became famous for housing a relic of the Holy Cross. In his homily at the shrine June 9, 1979, the Pope noted that the history of Nova Huta has been written by means of the cross, referencing the ancient cross of Megilla, and the contemporary cross in the city. Even amid rapidly changing times and technological advancement, John Paul II explained, the life of the human spirit, which is expressed by means of the cross, knows no decline, is always relevant, never grows old. He added, where the cross is raised, there is raised the sign that that place has now been reached by the good news of man's salvation through love. A new evangelization has begun, as if it were a new proclamation, even if in reality it is the same as ever. The cross stands high over the revolving world. It was perhaps the first time that John Paul II used the expression new evangelization. It was an idea that deeply influenced his pontificate, and the universal church. In fact, he twice repeated the sentiment in his homily at Megillah, further noting, from the cross of Nova Huta began the new evangelization, the evangelization of the second millennium. This church is a witness and confirmation of it. For John Paul II, it seems, the events of Nova Huta were emblematic of the church's task of reintroducing the gospel in Western societies, especially those that have lost a sense of God to progressive secularization. Thus, it is no coincidence that divine providence has linked the date of John Paul II's canonization, and the date of the defense of the cross in 1960. As it was in Poland more than five decades ago, the cross today is also, in a sense, being removed from politics, academia, culture, family life and the media the Christian faith becomes increasingly marginalized. The new evangelization, the great springtime for Christianity, therefore, depends on our own reaction to the problems of the contemporary world. 
It depends on our willingness to start a personal defense of the cross in the places where we live. In his encyclical Redemptoris Missio, John Paul II stated, the witness of a Christian life is the first and irreplaceable form of mission. This witness, he added, involves not only taking courageous and prophetic stands in the face of corrupt political powers, but also exercising humility, practicing charity toward the poor, weak and suffering, and imitating Christ's own simplicity of life. This task of the new evangelization, this call to Christian witness, is certainly difficult and demanding. Yet, inspired by St. John Paul II and the men and women of Nova Huta, we too must have the courage to take up and defend the cross in our society today. Thank you for supporting my channel. Please like and subscribe. May God bless you and keep you. Saint Pope John Paul II, pray for us.